We were told by North Koreans that no North Korean documentary maker had ever done what we'd done before. So we knew that this was a real, a real first. We met Pak Hyun's son and her family in September 2002. We'd been researching the film for about three months. We'd been into North Korea a couple of times. Um, and we'd asked for to meet a gymnast who, who was with the ball discipline. And we were introduced to Pak Hyun's son and, and her parents and grandparents at the Kim Il-sung Stadium where they practice. Um, and they were a, a little standoffish with, with us. It was the first time they'd met Westerners. You can tell at the beginning of the film uh, there's a scene by the river where the girl is introducing herself and her family and the grandparents are behind looking very aloof, almost like we really don't want anything to do with this. We went back on four occasions and the more we went back and the more time we spent with them uh, on and off camera, the more they relaxed. We got to know the, uh, the granny club of Hyunsun's apartment. Hyunsun's grandmother belongs to a granny club and they go off, they have her educational tours, they get her on the fun fair and, and that kind of thing. It was unfortunately never made it into the, uh, into the final cut, but um, Hyunsun's grandmother, they went on the, the big fun fair and onto the Big Dipper, um, all these 17, 80 year olds. And um, yeah, we asked them, were you not afraid? And they were like, we saw off the US imperialists, we're not afraid of anyone. And we were like, great answer. <laughs> Um, we found Kim Sung Yeon, we first went filming with them in April of 2003 um, and they were immediately relaxed. They were a very sort of happy-go-lucky family, lots of uh, action in the house. The, uh, the father, you know, says in the film, you know, I've, this house I wish it was boys but it's all girls and you know, they just talk a lot. Um, myself coming from a family of all girls, I know exactly what he meant. Um, and so they were extremely relaxed and it didn't take long for them to just be very comfortable with us. Song Yong keeps sneaking off to try and watch the children's movie and then the mother's trying to cook dinner and she keeps, you know, no, go and do your homework. And again, every parent can actually identify with that. And we did kind of say to them at the beginning, you know, don't worry, we'll fade into the background, you know, you won't recognise us after a while. And you think, well, they will recognise us because we're Westerners with a camera crew in, inside their homes. Because we're there so often, they just, in the end, just ignored us and just got on with their life. So over a period of time, certainly by the end of April, we kind of gained their trust. And from then on, you see in the film that they start to reveal more and more as the film goes on. The first shoot in February was just myself and um, my associate producer, Nick Bonner, just went in with a, a very basic uh, DV camera and, and very very basic microphone and we were just trying to get them to open up. We didn't know whether we'd use any of the footage, it, we ended up using quite a lot. After that we took our cinematographer Nick Bennett um, out. Um, we didn't have the resources to take the sound recordist with us so it was just three people at, at any time. It has its positives working light because you can react a lot easier. Um, but also there's an, an incredible strain on the three of you to try and get as much as possible with very, very limited resources. But I mean, we, we shot about 120 hours of footage. We only shot with one cameraman. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the mass games themselves, you know, were, were filmed over a series of performances. I was determined to use only our cameras and our angles rather than relying on the, the North Korean state cameramen. Uh, the North Koreans don't have any editorial control over the film. They never actually stopped us filming or prevented us from filming anything that we wanted to film, um, which was remarkable. I mean, we had a, a long list of things that we wanted to see. We wanted to go into the schools, into their homes. We really thought that we'd be provided with some of that, but not all of it. And in fact, they went beyond what we asked for. 
we had you know, a, a trip to Mount Pekdu on the train and, and no Westerner had ever taken that train before. You know, and it was 31 hours to, to go up and 44 to come back down, which uh, I think none of us will ever forget. I mean, really, I can't praise the, the North Koreans high enough as to the access that we were given. The, the film company that we worked with in, in North Korea was, was phenomenal in actually understanding what we actually wanted to achieve. Uh, through this um, and you know I'll never know why they did it but you know I'm very grateful for it. We made the film The Game of Their Lives in 2001 that dealt with the soccer team from 1966 uh, that came to England and played in the World Cup. Uh, it had taken four years us to actually get in and most of that was actually down to Nick Bonner um, who's uh, an Englishman living in Beijing who specializes in, in a wide variety of exchanges with with North Korea but we were allowed that access because it was a neutral story although we would deal with the history and the politics of the country it was by and large a, a sporting success and a, a story that certainly the North Koreans are extremely proud of from that access and the success of the film it showed both in North and South Korea we were able to get the, the access to do mass games. What we found with the game of their lives was that, you know, you could drop the politics and, you know, people can be people. Um, and that's really what we try to get with a state of mind that, um, okay, they live under a completely different system and they have beliefs that, you know, certainly a, a Western audience just can't understand. Um, but underneath all that, life goes on. We were there at a time when there was a very serious danger of, of the US either doing a preemptive strike or had the Iraq war been more successful more quickly, um, then they would have turned their attention to North Korea. And at the time, you know, we were asking North Koreans, you know, do, do you want war? And they were saying, yes, we're, we're ready for war. If, if the US, we'll not start anything, but if the US invades, we're ready and we will die for the general in order to achieve liberation and, and unification um, and having seen the the footage of the Korean War we were like are you sure you want that kind of thing and they were like well no of course we don't want war you know I want my kids to go through school I want to get a good job that's our primary concern and um, no one in North Korea wants war um, and that I think goes all the way you know through the nation um, but they certainly don't, wouldn't see I don't think uh, the US as a, a liberating force um, but yeah, I mean, we really hope that that day never, never happens because a, a war in Korea again would, would be the most horrendous, horrendous thing. You know, you have to put it into context. There's no internet, there's no mobile phones, there's no email. Um, there's very, very little, if any, outside influence uh, within North Korea. I mean, they've kind of gone on their own way. Um, no Starbucks, no McDonald's, no nothing. So. Uh, which is no bad thing. <laughs> People often say, are you, you know, afraid of the North Koreans censoring you or, or not allowing your film footage out? And there is the fear also that the footage could be used actually to say this is an evil place and it deserves you know, invading and, and liberation. And, and it's, it's frightening because you think actually what we're trying to do is just show a society. And this is it and try and understand it um, you know I'm not making a judgment one way or the other but here it is and, and you make your own mind up uh, and the thought of someone using it to actually invade and bomb and, and that is quite quite frightening um, but also the thought of it being used as propaganda for the others you know to sort of defend everything that's going on it is also quite uh, quite frightening I mean we just want people to to view it as an educated audience, to see something that they've never seen before and then make their own minds up. And if that can bring some sort of understanding and education you know, to, to a Western audience, then I think we've done our job. <laughs>